brother of mine right now. Uh, you might know him already, brother David Erohan, um, who has been, uh, this is the second time who is on, on my channel right now. The last time was in November where we spoke about the hypostatic union, we went into the depths and uh, I had this inclination to invite him again, um, particularly to speak about Christology yet again, because I do have the conviction that this brother is, is absolutely uh, a sanctified beast on that particular part. He has done his homework. He has, ha he has insights which are very useful for the body of Christ. So, Brother David Aaron, thank you for being here again, man. Yeah, appreciate you for the kind words. And uh, hopefully this talk is as good as many of my videos. <laughs> but jokes aside, yeah, uh, you know, as I, as I point out in like various different videos and as much as I can is that this is a quite an important topic. I mean, uh, I spent, I will say, one or two years to like, di like very diligently studying this kind of topic. I hope the background noise is, uh, if you're hearing it, I hope it doesn't bother you, the listeners. But um, yeah, I, I would say I'm ready. Yeah, man. No, the, the, the background noises don't bother at all. So, um, yeah, first of all, um, thank you for all the content you've been putting out. We already, I already mentioned before that you're putting out content online. What I notice a bit more that you are putting content that's a bit shorter, like eight minute videos. So, you already mentioned before that you were trying to, to um, explain it in a more simpler manner. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, I, I I remember in one stream I did, someone said, hey, David, can you like clip the stuff you talk, talk about, like do them in a short manner? I kind of got like mad at it because, uh, you know, you can't really, sh you can't really simplify things extremely. That's this kind of stuff is that uh, the 95% the of the approaches you see online about top, like difficult topics is, oh, I'm just going to copy paste an article. I'm going to copy paste an art argument. And they're going to do, the, do that job. That doesn't really work, okay? You kind of have to spend time and effort researching about something because if you don't do that, you know, you're not going to learn, right? You're not going to take the easy route in your college lessons, uh, like the difficult ones, the actual properly difficult ones. You're never going to be able to take the easy route. You have to actually study and take time. And I'm trying to do that. Yes, it's a bit more simple. It kind of shortens the time and it gives you sources and things like that. But it's still, um, you you know, there's got to be some effort from that side. But I also think that, you know, a lot of people, especially if you live in a society, I will say, that has missed out on a lot of the aspects of the fate. So maybe just focusing on that might be better, uh, depending on what we can discuss in the stream i mean i'm fine with both i'm fine with like elaborating on things and like being more difficult i'm also fine with like keeping things basic uh that's kind of like how my aim for like the next couple of days and kind of like just broadening my topics because i've been doing theology videos for like three years so far and like i i can do more it's just that you know i think I'm kind of getting bored, you know, like it's just doing the same thing over and over again. So that's the, that's the main thing. That's, that's how it's, that's how it's going with me the, la the last couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the Lord is moving you in order to not necessarily diverge from the path, of course, because if you're a specialist in everything, then by definition, you are not a specialist, but at the same time, it's very useful to, to diversify, uh, yeah, your, your, your area of knowledge. Um, and I 100% agree when we want to talk about subjects like Christology or the Trinity or whatever. Yeah, yeah. give me a TikTok video of like 10 seconds, please. Like, no, you're going to sit there. You're going to listen. You're going to engage. Uh, this is not something that, that if we can give bites as we can do it. But if you wanted to give the subject justice, then you need to be sitting down, engage, read the book, study for yourself. Um so yeah, and you're doing that, uh, doing a terrific job, man. Anyway, um, yeah, this, the subject um, that I would like to address in this particular session is already mentioned in the uh, in the titles, uh, Christology, mainly the diathelite and monothelite discussion about uh, Maximus the Confessor, etc. 
uh, also monophysite and diaphysite um, teachings throughout the church. Now, uh, already mentioned before is that um, I really try to understand the uh, my ancestors, the Armenian Orthodox heritage, and I also read this book, uh, Studies on the Formation of Christian Armenia by Nina Garcia. She passed away like last week, and this whole book goes straight through uh, St. Gregory, uh, the Illuminator, up until like uh, what happened after Chalcedon. And when I read this book, I was like, my goodness, there's a lot of, um, yeah, misunderstanding. You, you, you read about the historical context, etc. So I was really trying to know like where the stuff was. I don't want to say going sideways, but I would re really would like to see uh, what happened back then. Um, but let me start off with the first question. Uh, there's this objection that is primarily brought forth by uh, no other than Saint William Lane Craig. Um, and I'm joking, by the way. He says, for instance, and this is about uh, diatheletism, uh, he says that uh, when Jesus has two wills, that implies he, had, he is two persons. So when the objection comes, when you say that... Um, Will is a property of nature that is begging the question. Like, what would you respond to that particular objection to uh, the diathelite argument? Yeah. Well, the first thing I will say is that the Christological pres presuppositions that you have is going to affect your Trinitarian theology. So I have a stream that's about refuting William Lane Craig. So a lot of the arguments he makes, I've actually responded to, I will say in that stream. But that specific argument, the way I will say, first of all, if uh, if Christ has one will, this will mean that the will is hypostatic based on being one. If that's the case, then the Trinity has three wills because there are three hypostases. Now, if we're going to be saying that, you're going to have to say a lot of different characteristics of the different persons of the Trinity, likewise, will also be different from each other. Because what is will, right? What we call natural will in St. Maximus, and this is he defines disputation with Pyrrhus, is that it's the it's the natural appetite that is proper to the nature. So, if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have different appetites, they have different actions, they have different volitions, they have different movements, they have different natures. And uh, we, we think we believe, like generally speaking, when I say we, I mean in this sense, the modern society, right? And in modern society, we think that will or the mind is the person. We have kind of like an Apollinarian idea in the modern age. That's not really true. Uh, what we call will, again, generally speaking, is the appetite proper to the nature and the uh, the volition proper to that nature that moves or acts, moves or actions. So it has to be proper to nature, right? A um, Aside from that, to kind of remember at a point, uh, also, I will say, talks about not only scripture, but the Father's but scripture even talks about how uh, Christ has, there is the will of the Father, the divine will, and Christ's own will, which is his human will. I think the Gethsemane prayer show, illustrates the two wills, uh, which I also done a video on. In short, the Gethsemane prayer is about the humanity of Christ being a model for us. And there are two decisions in his prayer at Gethsemane. The one decision is to fear death, right? Avoid death, which is natural to the human appetite. So that's an example of will being proper to nature, is that Christ's fear of death, there's, the fear can be spoken of in two senses. There's the irrational dread, which is sinful, because it's born out of faithlessness. But, but then there's the fear of death, which is natural to human beings, because death is a separation of the soul from the body. So Christ had that kind of fear. He did not desire death. Who will desire death? If he didn't desire, if he didn't desire resistance to death, that is, then what he will be doing is suicide. But it, the the reason why it's not suicide is because he resists death. But simultaneously, acknowledging that he also coming or model in his salvation, especially a model for martyrs, he takes on the cup and he is crucified. He accepts his crucifixion again in his human will. So really, the two choices are good, both good choices that he chooses humanly and aligning humanly, freely himself to the will of the Father, that is his divine will. And so we, by doing the same thing, because Christ is our model, 
participate in his crucifixion, right? So that's one of the significances of diatilitism. So if we were to accept the things that say, we'd have to admit the soul is basically the person or the soul is identical to, or the per or personhood is in the soul. We will have to say that the Trinity has three wills. So they had three different decisions. Yeah. Guess what? Scripture says that, that the Son and the Father do have the same works. We are a movement of the will. The term work is, is a form of the word energia, energy. So Christ has the same energy as my Father. And energy is the movement of will. So they also have the same will. And this is how we know that the Father and the Son are consubstantial and are both divine. So if you're William Lane Craig, you can't really say that the Son have the same divinity. So really the position itself is an Arian position even because it denies the consubstantial with the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. So that's the main issue with saying that Christ only has one will. And that's like, there's other arguments too. This is not a super exhaustive argument. There are other problems that uh, St. John Damascus and St. Maximus the Confessor point out. But I will say this is um, this is definitely the main issue. Halfway through. Yeah. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, that's that's pretty much all I had to say for that. Yeah, that, that, that was the whole point. Yeah. So far. Now, that's a great thing, actually. When when William Lane Craig says that um, that uh, will is a property of persons. And then there are three persons. Then then there are three wills. Then there are three gods. So one thing I've come to notice, and especially like um, from this book, uh, Saint Cyril of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy of John McGuckin, one thing I've came to notice is that it isn't necessarily about hearing somebody's position. It's really about trying to understand in the the web of beliefs of in this theological web what the implications of the positions are so when you say that that jesus christ is for instance uh, just a creature and not god then by definition we are not saved in the whole schema or when you when you're a modalist then there are any more implications etc cetera, etc cetera. so when people have like a position or a claim uh they really, they, a lot of times they forget like the order of theologia, right? The, the order by which you do theology from the Trinity, Christology, etc. Um, and it's a very unfortunate thing to see today's saints, quote unquote, and I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious here, that their opinions were already chewed out by the fathers themselves. So that was a great answer, man. Um, because... Um, one thing that I would like to, I don't know if, if you have like what your perspective is on the Eucharist, because uh, I do, of course, believe that uh, in the real presence, I do. I've re I did have uh, I've read what Cyril said about the Eucharist um, and also see the logical implications uh, coming to it. But when you hear the objection like, oh, it's symbolic, the Eucharist, it is symbolic. Um, what would be, what would be your response to that particular objection? Well, uh, I, I suppose you could kind of uh, get to that from a sacramental point of view, right? What is the, what is the point of a sacrament? Well, the point of a sacrament is to enter into the life of Christ, right? Baptism is the entrance, and the Eucharist is the consummation of the life in Christ. Aside from that, um, in terms of the Eucharist. Again, it, it pretty much depends on your Christology. One of, that's one of the main things. Like we talk about, for example, oh, Christ says it's his flesh and blood, right? Uh, and, and all of that kind of stuff. I, I think the first argument I will use personally is just say, well, what did the early Christians believe? You can see the writings of the early Christians on this point. It is very clear that they believe that it is the real body and blood of Christ. Uh, secondly, what is the point in eating the body and blood of Christ? What's the whole point? Why do we do that? Uh, well, in the Old Testament, we have typology from Melchizedek, right? Bread and wine. And we also, ha we also have Christ saying that you need to have life, you know, that he is the life and we need to have his life. And so really the Eucharist is about partaking in Christ's life. And so the body and the blood of Christ are not mere body and blood, as St. John Damascus say, says, but it is the deified body and blood. It is the deified body, soul uh, of Christ. And it's 
you know, re really properly speaking, it's the body, soul, divinity that we are partaking of. And so bearing that in mind, that is the point of the Eucharist is, is that it is one of the many sacraments that is part of the life of Christ, but it's also, it's also the mechanics in which we are deified. So again, that's kind of like a simple answer, but to kind of like, you know, because some Protestants, I suppose, will say, uh, you know, it's just symbolic, right? Uh, it's just symbolic and it's not the real presence. Well, the first question I will ask is like, what makes you not believe real presence, right? Do you like, is it just, do you think it's impossible for God to transform, uh, you know, bread and wine into his body and blood? Do you think that's impossible? Or do you think that, you know, just consuming it doesn't matter? Like what makes you think that this is an unacceptable belief? Because again, you have to you have to notice there's multiple different websites that like have quote minds on this. Okay, the early Christians, it's very it's very basic. It's a very basic fact that they believe the Eucharist is the true presence, that it is that the that the bread and wine transform into his body and blood. They they use the term transform. That's a very specific term, and it's very close to the term transubstantiation i will say transubstantiation is in fact a modern term but for for the intents and purposes of this question in particular it is pretty much you can pretty much consider them the same thing right yeah like the, the term encapsulates like the concept it's not about the word but, it, but it's about the concept that it tries yeah. to imply yeah yeah, but, pretty much. But, but at the same time, it also implies, uh, or it has an, an element of the essence energies distinction, right? Oh, so yeah. So one thing that... Yeah, because body and blood are good. They're deified by the divine energies. That's why they're not just mere body and blood. They're, they're, bod they're the body and blood of Christ that is engulfed in a way by the divine energies. I mean, St. John Damascus says that, yeah. Yeah. And I was also thinking, like, can just the, the flesh and blood of a dude, of a creature, give you eternal life? No, right? <laughs> no. So th that's one of those positions again. Um, mm -hmm. What is your understanding of the term in hypostatized? And I, okay, I, I, yeah. I recently got this book of Leontes of Byzantium. I did not read it yet, but I knew now that it goes into depth of that particular term. So... What would you? Uh, how would you elaborate on that on that term? So, uh, prior to the, I will say the time period of the fifth council, um, in hypostasis. Well, we kind of have to look at the word "in," right? Not really the "in hypostasis," but "in" itself, right? Uh, and and how it's used in relation to different terms. And I will recommend reading Saint Gregory of Nyssa's anti-Apollinarian apologetics. He has, a, he has a book where he writes against Apollinarius. And he there's a discussion on the term ensouled flesh or enfleshed soul. And this is going to be relevant to in hypostasis because, for example, we can call the human nature enfleshed soul or we can call we can call it ensouled flesh. And ensouled flesh just means body that is united with a soul. Or that has a soul and the vice versa is like a soul that ha that is united with a body or that has a body okay and prior to the fifth century in hypostasis just meant having existence or existing generally speaking but uh it you know using the same principle existing in sacred griffness and other fathers it pretty much meant having a hypostasis so the reason why we for example say specifically that the human nature of Christ is anhypostatized is because we believe that Christ does not have a human hypostasis because that's pretty much the historian view, right? So then how will we explain? Because every nature must have a hypostasis. Then how do we explain that the humanity of Christ has a hypostasis, has an existence? Well, it is anhypostatized. That is, it has a hypostasis and that hypostasis is the divine logos himself. So in a very short and basic manner, that's pretty much how we will say that's what n is. And that's how it has been used. Uh, the more advanced usages of n I suppose, will be things like, you know, we will say that, uh, 
for example, we will say that the energies are n hypostatized. And what that means is that uh, when Christ acts in the world or when he acts eternally, the acts, you know, are personal. They're not just abstract, you know, separated from God himself or anything like that. They're personal. Okay. So when Christ is, you know, uh, when Christ is incarnate, in the incarnation is a divine energy. St. John of Damascus says that in the exposition of the Orthodox faith. Uh, that is a inhypostatic activity, right? But it's particularized in three different ways because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all participate in the incarnation, but in their respective modes. So the Father does it according to his good pleasure. The Son does it according to economy, which is why he is taking on the human nature. And the Holy Spirit acts according to consent in terms of the Nicene Creed or the Nicene Creed, whatever you want to call it. In terms of the Nicene Creed, it is the incarnation done of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. That's what the creed says, right? So all persons of the Trinity are in their specific mode acting on these divine acts. And so they particularize or in hypostatize this one divine energy in proper to their hypostasis. Again, this it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit out there. You know, you're not it's a it's it's an advanced concept, I will say. But uh, St. Maximus the Confessor, for example, talks about this in various different writings of his, right? So this is, that's another way in which a hypostasis will be used. That's kind of like the more advanced, but the basic manner is kind of like just having a hypostasis. The humanity of Christ has a hypostasis. What is that hypostasis? The divine logos. That is who he is. Right. Yeah. We, 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 we like within like Orthodox theology there's a very important distinction of uh, person nature energy or activity um, uh, effect uh, and also a couple other ones so it's it's, it's very important to, in order to to designate which one is which um, then my next question is and this is a very this is a very uh, important topic in this particular book mainly about how could it be that um, Paul says in Romans 8, 3, 1 Peter 4, verse 1, 3, 18, that God has suffered in the flesh. And now we're getting a bit more towards um, communicatio idiomatum. Could you, like, elaborate what the, what communicatio idiomatum actually means? Uh, in a very simple way, we will, we will say that it's the exchange of the properties between the two natures of Christ, where he, is, he as the one person, has the properties of both humanity and divinity. Another way of explaining this is, the, is that the divine energies deify the humanity of Christ. So, uh, and, and, and the third sense in which we can talk about this, I suppose, is that because the two natures have they share the same hypostasis in common which is the divine logos himself right the word of god the son of god jesus christ uh, that's what they share in common uh, in that person in jesus christ we can designate divine terms in a human manner in human terms in a divine manner so when we say that god was crucified we don't necessarily have to say that God was crucified in his divinity, right? When we say God is crucified, we say that God in his human body was crucified. Um, similarly, when we say that Christ walked on water, right? God walked on water, uh, you know, doing walking is something proper to humanity, but doing it on water is something that's pro proper to his divinity, right? And so the, the two natures have a very unique existence and a unique manifestation of their acts and of their willing in the person of Christ. Uh, not that they become one in every single sense, but that they become one in the sense that it's uniquely and hypothesized in the person, right? Um, and that the that the two natures operate. Uh, what is it? What is the term Saint Leo used? I forgot about it. But that the two natures operated in cooperation. And Saint Leo is a. Uh, I will say Saint Leo is actually. He talks about this a lot in his tome, which usually gets uh, ignored, but he does talk about this, right? He does talk about how the two forms, which is what he calls nature, he calls the nature's two forms, the two forms of Christ cooperate with one another when they do something proper to their natures. So right. there's kind of like an implicit idea in St. Leo where even when the, the flesh suffers, it is in, in humiliation, it is also a divine kind of a suffering, right? 
again, because the humanity of Christ is united with his divinity. So even though we will say that, yes, certain acts are proper to their natures, which is, again, why it's important to say that the will is proper to nature, because the will is the appetite of that nature. Uh, it is proper to these natures. Also, these natures are they communicate with each other. And it's not just a verbal communication. It's a genuine, real communication. So the humanity of Christ, you know, for example, human nature is not omnipresent. Human nature is not omniscient, right? But Christ can communicate the power of omniscience to his humanity. Even though omniscience is not natural to his humanity, it can still be communicated to him in his humanity. This is why, for example, people, some people say, well, how can the saints hear our prayers? And that, that, that's a, that question really confuses me because the saints participate in, they participate in God's divinity. They participate in his divine energies. And one of those energies is omniscience. So, you know, uh, they participate by grace. So they're not there's, naturally there's omniscient. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, first Timothy 2, 5. Yeah. And they think that it settles it. You're right. But, yeah. But, but really, you know, when you think about it, I mean, uh, St. Peter says that they partake in the divine nature of God. And St. Jerome says we partake of his divine nature through grace. So it is true grace that these saints participate in the divine energies of God. So God, you can say gifts, right? It's kind of like a mansion, right? There is a mansion analogy used for heaven. Uh, you know, these saints partake in God's omniscience, for example, so they can hear prayers, right? Um, so... I don't see any any reasons why like we can uh, we can like make that ask that question. Anyways, the point is that uh, in Christ it is the same thing, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The, one subject to natures, but I, I I do remember like a couple years back when I thought that that Jesus had two. I was like, wait, that that's not right. So I could understand why. Um, one will equals one person that makes sense to me but that makes sense to me in my fallen noetic abilities and at the same time the lord is not like us he's like us in some sense but unlike us in another sense um there's also one thing um that's also very neglected I, by the way i got a book about it one second I just got Good. this one today. Mm -hmm. Christ the Conqueror of Hell by uh, oh, Archbishop Hilarion. Archbishop Hilarion Alfeyev. Correct. Like when uh, Jesus died, he went to Hades, Hades. or Sheol. Mm -hmm. uh, I just followed Star about a month ago. It's Kugai. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Apostate Russ. So my question about uh, this one: When Jesus went to hell, was it his human his his body of his body obviously stayed in the tomb, but did his soul, alongside with his uh, with his hypostasis, like he himself went to hell? Like how would so, you yeah, so the question of will I uh, to kind of like finalize that? Uh, I just want to share the definition of Saint John Damascus. It says, simple willing is called will or the volitive faculty, which is a natural will and rational appetite. So I think that's kind of like answered the question. In terms of the descent into Hades, we need to kind of also remember that um, Christ is present in his divinity. That is, he is omnipresent in his divinity. And so when we say that he is omnipresent in his divinity, that's his hypostasis, right? So um, Christ is, you know... Uh, so when we talk about the descent into Hades, he was, you know, divinely present in his soul. So in death, his body was, his soul was separated from his body. And so his, his soul went to hell. And as it descended into hell, uh, because, again, the soul is deified by his divinity that is hypostatically united, um, hell, which is a place of darkness, right? The darkness analogy is very useful here because just like, how when light enters a room, darkness disappears. Christ entered into Hades. Christ entered into darkness and liberated those who listened to his gospel and received him. So he did this in his soul, right? So he was uh, just like we, 
you know, our person is present in our in our soul in the in the case of uh, in our death, which in the resurrection we're going to be reunited with our own bodies. We're not going to be we're not going to have new bodies. So we're going to have new bodies, but it's going to be our body, right? As in the historical body that we had. So, you know, when you die and you're resurrected. You know, the body that you're in right now is going to be the same body you're going to be resurrected in. That applies for everyone else. And it applies the same thing for Christ as well. Um, so we still have that personal connection with our body and our soul. But uh, our personhood resides in the soul after death. And likewise, um, Christ was present, well, Christ was present in his body, in his soul, and in his divinity, right? Um, and the point that I'm trying to get at is that that is why the descent of the Hades is very significant because uh, he preached the gospel. He enlightened, you know, he opened the gates of heaven and those who accepted his gospel, which some fathers speculate Plato was one of them, uh, they went to, to heaven with him, right? So uh, really the, the crucifixion of Christ is inherently cosmic in nature. It's it's inherently cosmic. It's right. It comprises of the entire universe, and it even comprises of the spiritual realm, right? Which is heaven and hell. Uh, so that's kind of how I will answer that question. Uh, is it yeah. possible for you to give me a minute? Because I, I really need to drink water right now. I need to take water. Break. Do your thing. Do your thing, brother. Of course. Okay, I'm back. Great, man. I should be back on the cam. All right. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I hope the stream. I hope my net connection works fine, having the camera on. But yeah. you can see my. <laughs> you can see my computer awesome, from the uh, reflection. Awesome, man. Oh, that's a mirror right there. Awesome. Uh -huh. yeah. Looks great, man. For so far, problems with the audio or video, so right, it's, it's cool. going good right now. Everything is good, man. Anyway, the, the last point that you mentioned before was already, like, like with Maximus, yeah, already. Also, it's stated in the New Testament, so the recapitulation, right? And it, 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 uh, so the, the concept you're going towards is also Christ, the universal person, right? Because Christ attained. Uh, humanity he, he also attached himself to us like i mm -hmm. have my own human nature and the body you have your own but at the same time in some particular way we are all and we all have this one essence and when god mm -hmm. came into that essence he elevated us mm -hmm. so that's um, yeah that's the, that's the physical nature of the incarnation and the soteriological aspect to it that is very often missed but this is a especially in Protestant Western circles, but yeah, that, what you're saying is pretty much believed by, for example, St. Ignatius of Antioch or St. Irenaeus of Lyons, one of the two. Uh, either way, uh, that's what we will say again, the physical nature of the incarnational soteriological... I couldn't find the term, yeah. but you get, you get the point that I'm trying to make, yeah, right? Is, it's, it's, is that it's, it's physical. It's, yeah, but, but it's all like this, man. It, it's uh -huh. not, I've, I've come to notice, it's not one doctrine, like this verse, this verse, this verse, and that's it. No, you have, you have to like understand that when you take away one card from the stack of, from the, from the house of cards, everything collapses into each other, right? So it's yeah. also very, things have to make sense alongside with each other. Mm -hmm. Like when you said, ah, the Eucharist is not the, the real presence of Christ, dude, so many mm -hmm. other points, as you mentioned before, and we also know that. Yeah. Um, I uh, that actually okay. reminds me. I mean, think of it this way, right? The, of a type, the point of a type, you know, when we talk about typology in the Old Testament, is to show it as like something that's going to be happen in the. It's kind of like a spoiler alert, right? It's like foreshadowing something. <laughs> Great point. Yeah. Um, to say that the type 
of Christ's body and blood. Yeah, I mean, you know, being the New Testament is, uh, I'll say, because my network, yeah, my network like yeah. much slower uh, with my camera, so I yeah. disabled it. But I was just, I was just saying before the before my internet connection cooked up a little bit, is that to say that the that the Eucharist is a type of Christ's body and blood, it's like a symbol. Um, I mean, I don't mind calling it a symbol, but you also end up saying it's a type. Well, the whole point of the Old Testament was foreshadowing things, and now you still say that oh, well, there's still foreshadowings. So there, there must be something extra coming up with the term with the sense of Eucharist. So, but I, but what does Christ say? Right, the law is fulfilled in Him. So expecting more types after the New Testament period is kind of it's a, it's a kind of a bizarre thing. Um, I forgot what you said prior to that. Uh, what were you discussing prior to about, that? About uh, Christ as the universal person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for yeah. First uh, Timothy two five is pretty much about that. I will say, uh, in his person, he mediates the two natures. That's literally how every yeah. single father that commented on passage, like literally say that. Yeah, so but it's, 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 it's like the, um, one thing I'm a huge proponent of, also trying to study a bit more. There's also this book, I know someone, someone Watford, I don't know what his name exactly is, about the communion of saints. And yeah. it's also one of the favorite verses in order to to refute uh, the communion saints is first Timothy two five, but it's first Timothy two five doesn't tell us anything about praying or not praying to to the saints or of the body of Christ. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, in multiple places it does want you to do that. But first Timothy two five is actually about uh, that the, our Lord being the God Man is the bridge from the human to the divine because yeah. He is both human and divine. Yeah, and it, it, it is that the history. Um, I don't know which verse it actually was, but it also says in Acts twenty four fifteen that even the righteous and the wicked that they shall be resurrected. Like when you ask a, a yeah. regular Protestant or whatever, which one does resurrect? Does resurrection automatically entail salvation? Yes. But wait, why are the reprobate resurrected? <laughs> yeah, like, and yeah. and and a better question to ask: If limited atonement is true. Then why is everyone resurrected? Shouldn't only the shouldn't only the elect be resurrected? But resurrection is universal. Why? Because the the crucifixion is, you know, Christ universally atoning for our sins, and we can participate in that atonement by partaking of the sacraments. Right. So that's the point of the sacraments. And the sacraments are all all about like modeling of Christ's life again, like the baptism, baptism, you know, being reborn. Uh, that's something Christ does. Not that he needed baptism, but by being a model for us, and also deifying the baptismal waters too, or the sacrament of marriage, for example. Well, we are married to Christ when we become Christians. When we become part of the church, we become one body with Christ. So, marriage is a sacrament for that reason. And there are many things in the church, not just the seven sacraments that are popular, but there are many sacraments, as St. Justin Popovich says, that uh, the, the church is filled with sacraments, and the church itself is a sacrament, right? So uh, you will notice that a, a lot of these doctrines that we have, and to be fair, the Catholics have too, it's just that they're not really, they don't really notice this themselves, but a lot of the doctrines we have is fundamentally Christological. It's fundamentally incarnational. Right, so again, limited atonement necessitates the denial of universals, donors, or the connection between particulars possessing the same universal. But again, it just contradicts the biblical message very clearly. Again, First Timothy two five becomes contradicted. Um, how can Christ be the mediator between God and man if he is not simultaneously God and man? That is, if he's if he doesn't have a human nature and a divine nature, right? And that if he mediates with God and man, it's, you know, if you believe in limited atonement, for example, that you would have to, you kind of have to say that the, the, the people who are not elect are not actually man, right? They're not actually human beings. That's kind of like what it is. And you end up having like the, these like weird social views as, as derivatives of that, right? Like, you know, I, I don't see how you cannot, for example, like, I don't see how 
you can, for example, be a Calvinist and have a social policy where you're like, slavery is evil, right? Like, it really kind of like leads to that, you know, it leads to these kinds of like strange social policies, you know, when you yeah, think about it, it. I thought it was predestined. Why are you mad? God predestined it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but also the thing is, um, would you affirm, like, I, as far as I'm concerned, it is the Orthodox belief that at the end of our salvation, of the Trinitarian salvation, is coming through the Father. Like in mm-hmm. countless places, John 1, 18, Matthew 11, 27, Luke 10, 22, it is the Son that exegetes the Father. And it is only through the Son that we get to the Father, John 14, 6. Mm-hmm. And Paul also mentions that. Well, Paul also mentions in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, it is by the Holy Spirit that convicts someone in his heart that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus brings us to the Father. And that's exactly what 1 Timothy 2, 5 actually entails. Would, would, it, would that be a way to exegete or to, to elucidate that one? Uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that? I kind of didn't sure. understand. <clears throat> no problem. Um, the, the conviction is, is that... Um, Coming to the Father is the end goal. If you would ask yeah. uh, Jesus, like, what is your pitch? Give me an elevator elevator pitch. Like, uh, just short and powerful. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They would mm-hmm. ask, why such a big deal to come to the Father? I don't get it. But uh, coming to the Father is actually where heaven is. And Jesus is that bridge, as we mentioned before, the God and man. Uh, mm-hmm. like, like the cross, for instance, pointed towards heaven. And this particular beam is for the earth, like where heaven and earth cross each other. Um, first team to five actually like fits like a puzzle in that particular whole schema. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I get what you're trying to say. Well, uh, I want to kind of put a disclaimer. What I'm about to talk about is going to be like very advanced and easy to ahead. misinterpret. So uh, that uh, let me put that disclaimer first. All right. So. We kind of have to ask ourselves, well, again, why is it the Son that was incarnate? And what does it mean to say that the divine acts are done from the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit? By the way, this is a biblical principle. Okay, St. Paul, I think it's in Romans 11.36, right? From whom, through whom, to whom. From, through, to designate the divine persons. From designates the Father, through designates the Son, to designates the Holy Spirit. And that's not the only passage that St. Paul makes that kind of a statement. Yes. But I will say in terms of the, the again, this is relates to the hypostatic mode in which these persons eternally will and act, not only in terms of creation, but etern- well, I guess in terms of creation specifically for this context. The way I see it personally is that the Father is in a sense like transcend you know he's transcendent obviously but like transcendent in the sense that you know we have to move to him right that he is invisible that he is far from us that's why he was the he was he revealed himself first in the old testament uh saint gregory the theologian says that the strongest form of revelation was in the holy spirit that was the strongest form of revelation why because the mode in which the holy spirit acts in the power of revelation is that it is in him. That's why it's the strongest. That's why the divine grace is strongest when you partake of it in the Holy Spirit, right? Because, again, Christ breathes the Holy Spirit onto the apostles. Um, that's where the divine grace resides and is spread to the apostles, right? Which gives them these charisms and such. So, uh, bearing that in mind, when we talk about the way in which the persons act, is like father the father is in the divine realm think of it that way the son right is between that he does you know he's true both realms in the sense when he's acting eternally both pre-incarnate and after the incarnation that's why he's the one who took on human nature because he is in between the realms right obviously they're god they're all god so they're all divine they don't have a place they don't have a realm or anything like that but in terms of temporal activities, is that what I'm referring to? And the Holy Spirit is the one that is sent from the Father through the Son. And this is why in Roman Catholic arguments, like they think that's the filioque. That's not the, that's not the filioque. That's no, not the Holy Spirit that's, being caused. That's, that's at extra, not at intra. This is the economic, yeah, economic yeah. trinity we're talking about. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, yeah, temporal, right? Yeah. But it's the it's the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son in temporal mission, uh, you know, whether it's divine grace or the power to prophesy, right? Because it's the Holy Spirit that inspires the prophets. I mean, the Father also inspires the prophets, the, the Son also inspires the prophet, but prophets, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's in the Holy Spirit, the power of inspiration is sent to the prophets. So... Um, the, the Son is a perfect image of the Father, as St. Paul says in Hebrews 1.3, and the Holy Spirit reveals Christ, right? He is what allows us to see Christ. That is why when we pray, we pray in the Holy Spirit, we pray to Christ, and to Christ, since He is the natural image of the Father, our prayers are to the Father. That's how we have one worship. We don't worship three persons, wow. but we worship, that, we, we worship three persons, right? But ultimately, we worship the Father. But the way in which we worship the Father is in the Holy Spirit through the Son. So that was amazing uh, because my, my next question would be about the prayer. We already like, like almost answered it. So, uh, oh yeah. Okay. So praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. right. So that's kind of how like the way I understand it at the very least is like in terms of like the relationship between God and creation is that you can kind of think of it like a, you know, it's, it is triune, right? The Father is like utterly transcendent in a sense uh, because, you know, utterly transcendent can also mean absolutely unknowable and you can't know in any sense, even outside of just essence, which is, you know, goes into strange arguments. You know, both, the, all the persons of the Trinity are unknowable in their essence, right? But utter transcendence can be seen as something stronger than that. But in a sense, it's utterly transcendent and, and the Son, in a sense, is kind of like the middle between them. And the Holy Spirit is what reveals God to us. Right. So that is the role in their activities. And this is, this is the hypostatic mode in which they act in the world. Again, St. Maximus the Confessor talks about this, I will say, quite extensively. If, especially if you read Free Choice and St. Maximus the Confessor by Dr. Farrell. You know, he has a, he has a part yeah. where he talks about this, right? So it's it's a bit difficult concept to understand, but it is actually biblical. It is a bit. That's the funny thing. It is an it is actually a biblical concept. And in fact, it is when you read yeah. when you read the Bible through that understanding, it allows you to see how and why God did things the way He did things. Right. You know. You know. One thing that I like hate is the hate is a big word, but I hate the fact when people come in and they're telling, yeah, it's all complex. It's all too, too much for me to understand like that's not an argument just because mm -hmm. you cannot fathom it or you have neglected all these years to study it does not make you all of a sudden someone of a position in order to say something about it so god it already by definition should be beyond our comprehension and for mm -hmm. a lot of people that it's still it's it's not a satisfying answer like how could you say such a thing but yeah because i really like if it comes to prayer, my conviction is is the best type of prayers are the prayers that you do. A lot of people are like, yeah, how should I pray? Etc. Like just pray. Like the best type of books are the are the ones that you read. Like so exactly. just do it. So, but I, there is uh, uh, like there is no a D's and F's for prayer, but there is a way to get an A, and that is uh, in the spirit, uh, in Jesus' name, to the Father. So at the very end, of course, the Father is the one who gets all the glory. Like in Philippians 2, verse 10, 11, like uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that, that, Christ, uh, that Christ is Lord, etc. To the glory of God the Father. So yeah. it, 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 all, it all comes back again to the Father. And Yeah, but the yeah. glory is also undivided. And remember, uh, the yeah. glory passes from the image to the prototype. Just like how when we venerate a artificial icon, and an artificial icon just means an icon made of wood and, and, and stuff like that, the, the glory we are giving it to that image passes over to, again, the prototype, that is what is being depicted. So that is also why iconography, which for a lot of people is very difficult to understand, really iconography is fundamentally a Trinitarian doctrine. Uh, to deny iconography is really to deny the relationship between the Father and the Son and really to deny man, right? The, that man is made in the image of God. And this gets into a, like a, a little bit of a fun fact, okay? Is, um, and, and this is something that a couple of church fathers even stated, is 
if you notice about the generation, the existence of man, you know, we, we talk about how the Father is unbegotten and the, the Son is begotten and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, right? Like these hypostatic properties that allows us to distinguish, which talks about the mode in which these persons exist. Well, that's actually the same with man, right? Remember, think about it. Adam is unbegotten, right? He doesn't have a father in that sense. Mm -hmm. Seth is begotten as Adam's son. But notice Eve. Eve is not begotten. Eve is not, you know, Eve is not uh, the daughter of Adam. Eve proceeds from the rib of Adam, right? right? So man himself exists unbegotten, begotten, and proceeding. And this is the case because man is made in the image of God. And I believe in the Old Testament, uh, when we look at this, when we look at the ma manner in which uh, man exists, it really is pointing us to the Trinity. And it's talk, you know, this is like the first chapters of Genesis, right? Yeah. So, I uh, yeah, I, I agree heavily because. Uh, the, the, the part of what you said about Seth uh, as begetting a procession is very insightful. But I do, did, a, for instance, affirm like Genesis 1.27, for male and female, he created them. Genesis 2.22, that Eve was brought forth from the, the side or the rib of Adam. And Genesis 5 verse 2, that he called them Adam. Adam and Eve, he called them Adam. Meaning? Exactly. In the beginning was Eve. Eve was with Adam and Eve was Adam. Like, yes. does it ring a bell? Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Adam Adam in Hebrew means man. Hmm. So, and a funny, funny little caveat, it also means man in Turkish. <laughs> Adam means <laughs> man, right? Hmm. Um, Adam also, Adam, which is the Turkish translation of Adam, uh, means mankind. And it's also a name. Right, so this it, it's actually something that is still a part of Middle Eastern culture. But it, it all the point of this is to illustrate that you know how the Son, the Holy Spirit, are God in the sense of having the same nature, whereas the Father is God, you know, in the sense of nature, but also in the sense that He is unbegotten. Right, He is the fountainhead right. of the Trinity. So that is why when when John says, you know, the Word was God and the Word was with God, it allows us to understand that. You know, the word was God because he has the divine essence and he is with God because he is with the Father. Right. Yeah, awesome stuff. It's also one of the, when people say like, how can in God there be a hierarchy? How can, the, or that the, the, the Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton is only applied to the Father. Nonsense. The word Adam is also applied to Adam and to Eve and to both mm -hmm. of them. So like, yes, of course, the head of Eve is Adam. But at the same time, they're also one in essence. They all have the one undivided. Yeah, a, a lot, it's a very Trinitarian stuff. But also the procession part with Seth, I did not hear that one. So thank you for that particular round. Yeah, I t uh, maybe St. Gregory the Theologian talks about it. I don't remember exactly, but I do remember there is I there is at least one church father I have read that talks about this very briefly. Yeah. Let me see if there are any more All right. questions. Oh, by the way, I did read um, this particular article of uh, a former guest of mine, Dr. David Bradshaw, mainly on polymers and the distinction cut epinoia. Oh, yeah. That's, this, that's this, a, yeah. That's a very interesting. Uh, what, are, what are actually your thoughts on cut epinoia? Well, I, I have a video on that article. So it's called Conceptual Distinction in Orthodox Christian Theology. So if you read Leontius of Jerusalem's Against the Monophysites, in his Aporia, he has, a, he has one specific Aporia where he deals with the question of the conceptual distinction of the two natures in Christ. And he's responding to the argument of the Monophysites where the Monophysites say, well, St. Kirill of Alexandria says that we distinguish the two natures conceptually, Therefore, you cannot say that there are two natures, right? And so there's kind of like this dialectic between conceptual and reality, right? As if anytime you talk about something conceptual, it is opposed to the real. Leontius pretty much says that's not the case. So an argument he uses is pretty much saying, well, how are you going to distinguish between something visible and invisible? It's not going to be empirically because 
you can't vi you can't see something invisible you know so of course it's going to be a conceptual distinction because the only way you can see the invisible is see it with your mind which is also you know invisible uh so that's the only way you can distinguish and that's why we say conceptual distinction another reason why we say conceptual distinction is that the distinction is real but the division is what's you know not real opposed to the real so when you bear that in mind because because think of it this way whenever we think about something right two things united with each other even if we say that they're indivisible our mind is going to conceptually divide them because that's the way we can kind of you know, come to learn something, right? I mean, uh, in the article, you will see a lot of fathers say that in the mind, a lot of, you know, conceptual distinction means the mind treats a simple thing as if it's complex. And so in this case, uh, St. Basil the Great is talking about the divine energies, right? He makes a conceptual distinction between essence and energy. And he pretty much makes the case that, you know, God is divinely simple, but we conceptually come to see a lot of these different things about him, these different characteristics about him, like his immateriality, his goodness, his right. justice. These are all different from each other. These are all really aspects of God. So there is a genuine divine plurality there. But this plurality is not of essence because there are not many essences, right? And St. of Alexander himself says, incorruption, immateriality, these are not essences, right? These are, these are characteristics of his essence. So the way in which we can talk about them, again, is conceptual. So the, right. what we need to understand, and a lot of people jump on this like a bunch of fishes uh, or a bunch of frogs, whatever analogy you want to use, is that every time a saint something says that something is distinguished conceptually, don't just instantly assume that it's opposed to the real, Okay. Sometimes a conceptual distinction can be a real distinction. Uh, now, uh, some some very silly person said, "Oh, well, you criticize Thomas Aquinas for making a conceptual distinction." Well, the, the conceptual distinction of Thomas Aquinas is opposed to the real. So, of course, I will criticize that, and I will say that you know when he makes conceptual distinctions, I won't accept that because for him, conceptual distinctions aren't real. When he uses that terminology, it, he is very different in that in that view from the orthodox view. Uh, so the the fathers again they use these a lot of these terms can be very much misunderstood, which is the precisely the main reason why I always tell people you know don't you're not going to learn anything by quote minds or anything like that. You got to read stuff because. Yeah. You know, I know about this stuff because I've read this stuff. But ninety-nine percent of the people who talk about this now they, they don't they they get uh, they get filtered. I, this is a very easy way to get filtered. So I definitely recommend people to read the Bradshaw article on Cartier. I think it's excellent. Yeah, man. On a particular last point that you're already mentioning, I've, re I've really come to love reading. Like when I came to the Lord, there was so much hunger. There was so many things were clicking, and, and I just love the fact that I can grab grab a book, uh, put on Mark's hymns or whatever type, of start reading. And yeah, unfortunately, that is the fact, or it is the case that a lot of people online or whatever way you like it, they have their own convictions. They feel in their heart that they are right. Like, who needs those those traditions of, of men of 2,000 years old? Like where I know my stuff. Like all I'm doing right now is I'm just using the arguments of my spiritual ancestors. It's like, wouldn't you think that if God would come into his creation, he would know how his church would work throughout time? And then you are trying to negate that. That's blasphemy in my eyes. Anyway, um, but also if it comes to Kat Epinoy, it, yeah, it, it was a very interesting thing. Like he also says in his article, soul and body are distinguished only in epinoia like we are mm -hmm. one being but we also have a body uh, like in orthodox position we have a body mind and noose or some mm -hmm. would say spirit etc so but yet all these three are conceptually they are one so um yeah it, it is all very technical and i do believe like in hindsight that the oriental churches and the eastern orthodox churches up until like the Council of Ephesus, 
went very well. But yeah, unfortunately, in 451, Armenia also had like the Persian War, etc. And I did read like um, Proclus. I don't. I do. I do not think that he was the Archbishop, Archbishop of Constantinople. But he was trying to reach out towards the Armenian churches, etc. But you know, Armenians are very stubborn. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, Proclus. Uh, you're referring to Proclus that uh, Father McGuckin talks about, right? In exactly. the Yeah. Um, I. Yeah. It is quite unfortunate that he died at the time that he did, but God knows best. So, you know, uh, th that that's also another thing to bear in mind. But. I think that's an interesting detail because it also shows you that in Constantinople there are a lot of people who uh, used Kyrillian terminology, including one nature, but they actually understood it in a correct manner, right? So that's the what, what I find very funny is, um, and again, I pointed this out in my debates against uh, the, the two Monophysite guys that I debated, well, actually three, uh, if I include Kakish, is... Um, <laughs> is the the people who wrote the definition of the fourth ecumenical council were like i think nearly every single one of them was a miaphysite that's like the funniest part for me like every single one of them hated theodoret every single one of them hated the stories they hated like the partisans and the people who had a good history with them they hated every single one of them even the antioch i think domus of antioch even he was like super anti theodoret and stuff like that and a lot of them were people who said, yeah, we can use one nature terminology in a qualified sense, which the Fifth Ecumenical Council already accepts it in a qualified manner. And they all said, yeah, and we should say that Christ is in two natures. I mean, I think that really showcases kind of like the orthodox position and how it kind of harmonizes these, these terms. And, and that, that, that's what makes the whole like situation in the fifth century like really bizarre to me. Right, it's uh, it's it's incredibly bizarre how like, like I read some of the arguments that are being made. It's to me, it's uh, it's crazy. I mean, again, conceptual distinction. That's something in the Fourth Ecumenical Council uh, acknowledged in two natures. Right, that's that's conceptual distinction. It's because uh, the term you use there is gnorizumenon in Greek, and the Fifth Ecumenical Council uses the same kind of terminology. It basically says that unless you acknowledge the distinction of the two natures in Christ to be conceptual, then you don't understand the Chalcedonian definition correctly. But again, what does it mean to conceptually distinguish the two natures? That we know that there is a true, real distinction between the two natures of Christ, even after the union, but we, the manner in which we know of this distinction is conceptual. That is what conceptual distinction means. And that is something a lot of people miss out. Yeah. The, the, the emphasis on conceptual. When we say, for instance, that, that Jesus was begotten from the Father, like you don't, you, they do not understand it. it is an analogy. Like I have right there, I have the book of uh, Analogia Entis, which tries to... Um, the languages that we use, it should imply something that is eternal, etc. There, there is no unequivocal statement that exactly implies God's essence. Therefore, God is a shepherd. Therefore, God is an eagle. Therefore, God is like a mother. Therefore, God, etc., etc., etc. So when people are getting attached to a particular word, that's like, as Basil says, that's the root of all heresies in also John of Damascus. Um, but there, I've come to notice that uh, when I read um, the Armenian history, particularly on Christology, there was also this period of Eutychianism that um, the human nature of, of our world dissolved or like fused together in the divine nature and it became like one or like completely vanished in some type of sense. What are your thoughts on, on yeah. that particular heresy? Eutychianism, I mean, it's just, that, well, Eutychius was a very stupid person and I'm not even saying that in like a funny meme haha -ha sense. He literally was a very stupid person. And uh, a, a proof of his stupidity is this: is that he said that the, that Christ was consubstantial with the Virgin Mary, but he was not consubstantial with the rest of us. He's like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> like what?" Yeah. And he says that he says, he says this in the home synod of Constantinople. Um, now he re he renounces this in Ephesus too, but then he teaches it again, and uh, and then you look at the 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 saints of the Oriental Church. And they pretty much basically say, yeah, 
uh, you think he's yeah, defending him was a mistake, right? Like they admit it was a mistake. They 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 say that like even Orientals don't like this guy. So like that just goes to show you how bad how darn bad this guy is. But I think principally speaking. Uh, Eutychius's case really shows us how there's like very different views in the union of the two natures and how we can understand it because his position was pretty much that the two natures just like mix together, right? And there's mm -hmm. kind of like this Christic nature. Well, uh, Saint, jo if if you read the Orthodox, right? Because one general criticism you have about this like topic of the Orthodox and the Orientals, etc., one general criticism you hear is that oh it's these people just talked over each other the the orientals weren't eutychians but what you notice when you read the orthodox fathers is that their arguments for the eutychianism of severus of antioch for example they're not saying that oh severus unironically argued for it they're saying that his position leads to eutychianism and guess what that's the same kind of argumentation saint Kirill of alexandria used against nestorius so uh, if that is the case, right, if, if what they say is true, then by their own logic, we have to exonerate Nestorius then by that logic. But obviously, these people are not going to want to do that, right? Uh, so that's that's the problem, right, is that Severus's system, Severus's Christology necessarily leads to either Eutychianism or Nestorianism. Both are bad, both are condemned heresies. So, you know, pick your poison because you end up reading to a very simple dilemma that St. John Damascus used, which to be honest, I didn't even know about this until I read book three, uh, but uh, that that, that St. John used this argument because I've been using this argument for two years now and I still haven't heard a sufficient response, but the argument is really simple, right? If Christ is one nature out of two natures, then is this one nature created or uncreated? If it's created, it's not divine. If it's uncreated, it's not human. If it's both, well, one thing cannot be simultaneously created, uncreated. So it has to be two natures. So whatever whatever option you take, you're not in a good position. And that's like yeah. the point St. John is making. That's the point he's making. Uh, in book three, particularly, especially after reading Severus, what I've noticed is that like 80% of the book three is like St. John just attacking Severus of Antioch. And like a lot of people don't really see that. Because some of the arguments he makes are like very, really, really fringe arguments. For example, he talks about numbers, right? Enumeration. And if you were reading it for the first time, you didn't know what, what he was like, you'd be like, what is he talking about? Like, why is he talking about number theory? Like, what the heck's going on? But if you read Severus, you understand, aha, he talks about number theory because Severus has a weird understanding of numbers because Severus believes the moment you start talking about two, is the moment you start talking about division, where St. John Damascus says, no, numbers imply distinction, but not right. division. So that's the whole point St. John is making. And if you don't read Severus, you're not going to get that. And so, like, I kind of had that privilege of reading him. Like, so I know how he's talking about, but I've noticed, like, even, like, Jay, who's, like, he's excellent, right? Jay Dar is excellent. Like, he didn't know this because he didn't re read Severus extensively, Right. Uh, but I talked about this, for example, in my talk with uh, Dr. Bo Branson on this. Uh, and I think Dr. Bo Branson is, in fact, writing a paper on this very topic. Uh, you didn't hear it from me. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he's, he's, he's been looking into this topic, like numbering and stuff like that. So uh, there's a lot of different presuppositions into these, into these things. And St. John Damascus is pretty much attacking a lot of these. So it's very important that we bear that in mind as well. Yeah. Right? It's not, again, it's not as simple as uh, this, this saint says this, this saint says that. You have to understand the presuppositions and the worldview. Exactly. Like, ironically, the, the first chapter of this, of this book of John of Damascus on the Orthodox faith starts off with a, a solid, I don't know how many pages it would be, about philosophy, mainly on the, on the, on the, particularly on natures and persons and uh, energies and those type of stuff. And what you already said before is like a, 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 such an ancient dictum of Orthodox Christology and Trinitarian theology of distinction does not entail composition. Like on so many levels that that is the case. Distinction does not entail composition. 
just because the Father and the Son and the Spirit are distinct does not necessarily say they are composite or separate from each other. Yeah, it doesn't imply division. That is like the main thing, which you will notice in Severus's writings, uh, letters 19, 22, 23, and then I think 62, he says that the person in the Trinity are divided, right? Tritheism. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you got you got a very <laughs> uh, this guy. Wait. The, ah! I know this guy. This guy's a sixteen year old dude who's changed religion six times in a year. Yeah, okay. So you can you can delete it. Right there. Yeah. yeah, I'll do. I'll do. That's also like uh, before I, I I was doing um, live streams like this once I was just recording on Zoom. The great thing about Zoom is that you have like all the focus uh, on the conversation, but then at the same time you have to upload it again, etc. So it's very efficient to do live streams. But at the same time, yeah, the sad part about live streams is you can demons manifest. But anyway, yeah. Well, well, you know, um, I just for me personally. I just find it incredibly strange living a life where all you do is look at live streams of people you hate and posting negative things about them, taking like you're watching the entire stream. That's the funny part of it. This comment in particular, this is very interesting. Okay. Everyone is watching this, like bear this in mind. Um, he's, he hates on me because I said reading Severus is a privilege, but first of all, reading a heretic is a, is a privilege because yeah. you know, their heretical positions, right? The church fathers, when they were refuting the heretics, they read these heretics. I, I, I read Thomas Aquinas, but there are and, so many uh, things I, I do not, I don't do not agree yeah, with. Yeah, and uh, and I know I know that there is a 20th century saint of uh, you know saints uh, saint you know uh, Ignatievich of something something mountain says you shouldn't read the writings of heretics, which is also true, right? But uh, the point is, you know. That's like a very, that's a comment I made, passing comment that is being construed negatively. So that means this person watched a very significant portion of the stream. And this person spent the, spent the entire time listening just to find something strange I said to make that comment. I personally don't understand how someone can live a life like that and like not be embarrassed of themselves. That to me is a very embarrassing kind of life, you know? Yes. Um, and, and a lot of people online are really like that. I mean, I guess it's like really off, off, out of topic, but like there's a lot of people like that online. It really boggles my mind. Like, well, how, will, how do you, like what makes you, I understand not liking people, right? When I don't like someone, you know what I do? I don't listen to them. I don't spend time with them. I don't interact with them because why will I? I don't like them, so I don't want to do negative things. Yeah, I want to produce it, things. Yeah, I want to. I want to create things and help people. Exactly the last thing that you said. You're you. The thing that you should be focused on is on being productive. Like exactly. They, they there's like they, they're in a certain type of emotion. They're trying to instigate something or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But there will come the day when like, why am I doing this? Why? Why bother? So like, it's a, it's a young buck. He must be full of stupid ideas. So yeah, if if you're focused, like, oh, there, what was this um this whole quote? Uh, losers focus on winners. Winners focus on winning. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 By the way, a uh, a 15 year old who switched religion six times cannot anatomize anyone. Okay, Whoa. bishops anatomize people, not a, you know, not laymen online who probably aren't even received to the, whatever, whatever one of the three thousand uh, TO groups that they're part of, right? But um, well, I guess I guess what makes me sad is like, you know, it, because it's online, the, the craziest people get recognition, and right. people take them seriously, and that's kind of like what makes me say is like, the hell is going on? Like, what what is going on? Right? It's kind of yeah. crazy. Um, it's like, it's like people taking you ticky seriously, <laughs> you know, let me see what this brother is saying. What I was right. baptized in Armenian monophysitism, but grew up in Antioch, then broker, then genuine orthodoxy in 17 years. What is this slander? Yeah. Yeah. Wait a second. Did I, didn't I just walk? Cringe. It? No, he made a different account just to make that comment. <laughs> oh my goodness 
Uh, uh, welcome to live streams, buddy. Yeah. Okay. Block this user. I'm not gonna have many followers because I am the type of person who blocks easily. When I see there's a yeah. manifesting block, my like you know, like Sam Shimun, like he has like he has like the biggest block list that you could ever think of. Um, I'm trying to think of um, a a relevant thing to say about um, about the topic at hand. Yeah, that's yeah. that's right. We were streaming yeah. about Christology. Oh gosh, I forgot. <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah, like. Um, like I do see, uh, the, the longer I study uh, the Trinity and, and the Christology and also the soteriological implications alongside with it, like it is almost non-negotiable that the Lord is one person with two natures. Exactly. You know, and his divine nature is consubstantial, consubstantial with God the Father, and that he incarnated in a mode by which the Spirit and the Father did not. Mm -hmm. um, like... Yeah, yeah, with all the respect for, for all those who do not believe, you have to be demonically blind in order to say that the Bible does not speak about the Trinity. Like, honestly. Yeah. Like, like, it, it, like so many verses go with each other, and there's like this bottom-up buildup of, of how God reveals uh, himself. And as a matter of fact, he has to reveal himself in the fullest sense. And this is a way, segue we, that we could go into. Um, the thing about um, the beatific vision, like John mm. says in First John three two, that when Lord when Jesus comes, we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is and be holy as he is holy or pure as he is pure. So, the, the reason why the last book Revelation is called Revelation because then we we shall see him as he is. Right now we cannot see him because we have to be covered in his in his sacred blood in order to. Not to evaporate when when he comes back again, but um, what are your thoughts on the beatific vision as as a as a doctrine? Yeah, so uh, the very basic presupposition of you know the theology of the early fathers is that the divine essence is incomprehensible. Okay, so to say that you can see the divine essence or to comprehend the divine essence, which is what beatific vision is about is to deny that right a human being the only being that can comprehend the divine essence is god himself only he can comprehend it right not us not angels not created beings so that's the first thing i will say the second thing i will say is that seeing the son as he is well again how do we see the son in his energies that's how we see god right we see that we see god by his divine operations as same base of the great says in letter 234. So uh, we need to also understand that just because we saw, for example, we know God from one energy doesn't mean that we have seen him full. There's many energies of God that we don't know about, right? right. And so we're going to see him as he is in his transfigured state that is after the resurrection, right? Because after the resurrection of Christ, his body was transfigured, that is, it was incorrupt. His body was corruptible, and then it became incorrupt, right? Uh, that is, you know, due to the resurrection. It's like the same is going to be us. And so we are going to be partaking of divine, God's divine energies in the Son uh, after our death and resurrection. So that's what John, right, Apostle John, is talking about. He's not talking about the beatific vision or anything like that. And to be honest, right, uh, you can search that, you know, verse in uh, in what was the what was the application again? It's uh, the shaft set. Uh, you can search that, like what the father said about that verse in the shaft set, and you can probably see things that contradict the beatific vision. Maybe, I mean, I guess Saint Augustine. Uh, I don't know about that, but like in the Eastern Fathers, you're going to see a very different interpretation. I will wow. say. Yeah. Well, I, so I, in my again, in my personal opinion, is that. Well, not in my personal opinion, but I think it's just straight up impossible to be able to see the divine essence. Right. Because if you if you could see the divine essence, that will make you God. Yeah, that only God can comprehend them. Then, but like obviously, when we say in Second Peter one verse four that we shall become partakers of divine nature, it does not mean that we shall become a different hypostasis of the Trinity. Obviously, 
But when mm -hmm. uh, Leviticus 11.44 or Matthew 5.48, I could be wrong. Uh, in Leviticus it says, be holy for I am holy. In Matthew, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And also says in my, Matthew 5 verse 8, those who are pure in the heart, they shall, sh they sh shall see God. But I yeah. do believe that in, in, um, in some sense, we being holy as he is holy does make us like divine, but not necessarily like God himself. We, sh we will always uh, uh, remain creaturehood. We will always remain it. Like a, a, a perfect analogy, I didn't know what, what book it actually was. Like, for instance, uh, when, when you have like a sword, a sword is made of iron. When you put it inside of the iron, it gets heated up. It starts glowing. It, it gives light, but it still has its uh, the property of iron. And I do believe that when when God is coming, uh, when God comes back again, we still we still attain creaturely uh, nature, but at the same time we are purified and uh, yeah, we'll be revived and we'll be healthy. We will never we will never die, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, it's it's just the way how you understand it and how you execute it. Like a lot of Muslims, for instance, they said, like, oh, the, the Bible is full of shirk. Look, they turn, they're saying that, that everybody is going to become God. Dude. Anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, again, this is pretty much what happens when you don't distinguish these categories. I mean, again, uh, St. Jerome commentates on uh, partakers of divine nature by saying we partake not in nature, but by grace. Grace is a divine energy. So it's true, the divine energies that we partake of is divine nature. And what... What does the divine nature remind us of? The divine characteristics, right? Incorruptibility and things like that. That's what we're going to be partaking in, not the incomprehensible, super essential divinity of God. Um, if, you know, many, many fathers, like when they talk about the divine essence, they're like, they, they make the case a lot of times that the divine essence is in no, it's incomprehensible, totally. Right. Yeah. Cataphatic Cat theology all the way. Yeah. yeah. That's that's precisely why like the beatific vision is not a thing in orthodoxy. I mean, if if the Roman Catholics said, Well, we are seeing the divine energies of God much clearer and they're manifesting us much clearer, then I mean I guess I would say, Okay, well, you know, if that's what you mean, then you're orthodox, right? But that's unfortunately not the dogma of beatific vision in Roman Catholicism. At least not the way I I've heard anyone explain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think if I'm trying to figure out any other questions, like all the major things that we we already addressed. Um, yeah, a lot of study for me to do right now. There are so many books I'm trying to read, so many things I'm trying to digest. Do you have any recommendations? Like, brother, if, the, if you read this book or this particular article, Go for it. This is a, a spiritual meet. Do you have some suggestions for us? Uh, well, I do plan on eventually making a video where I'm like, top 10 books you should read. But have you read God, History, and Dialectic by Dr. Farrell? No, I, I've heard that one. Uh, I'm sure the, the thing is about Holland, some books you can get quite easily, but other books, they're like nowhere to be found. But th that particular one is very interesting. Yeah, uh, I will recommend you read that. Uh, there you can buy it as PDF. It's available online. Uh, it has some spelling errors in the PDF. I don't know if it's the same in hardcover, but aside from that, it's it's an excellent book. I, I think it's like the number one book that I would recommend anyone read. Um, let me think about the number two book. Uh, I, I don't think anything comes close to that book. So, can you read PDFs? Like, are you fine with reading PDFs? Yeah, I, I do print them out. <laughs> I do okay. read PDFs, but then print it out. But anyway, go ahead. Okay, okay. So maybe you can even find like a. Um, I don't know. I don't think I don't know if I'm allowed to say that that on YouTube actually, but you know what I'm trying to get at, right? Maybe you can find a demo copy. That's the that's the that's the way I'm gonna say. It. You can maybe find a demo copy, right? And uh, for like the entire thing. So online as PDF, but uh, yeah, I, I will recommend that. Outside of that, I mean, a, a lot of different books that I've read deals with a particular issue. The, why, the reason why I like Goddess and Dialectic is that it deals with every single thing. It deals with everything. That's what makes it perfect for me, at least. Aside from that, 
if you're in terms of Christology, I would recommend reading uh, Kenneth Warren Vesh's Leon, uh, book on hypostasis in Leontes of Jerusalem. The title is like really long, but like uh, it's it's the, it's a PhD dissertation available for free as PDF online. You can download it straight up. Um, that is a really good book when it comes to Christology. Disputation right. with Pyrrhus, short book. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Aside from that, uh, let me think. I mean, I guess Confession of Saint Sophronius, if if because it's a dogmatic book, right? Uh, Meyendorf's Byzantine theology is kind of good, but it's like it's like a like Goddess dialectic is like an upgrade. So like, why bother with the with the downgrade, right? So, uh, but you can read that if you want to. It's 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 shorter. That's like the main pro of it. In contrast, other than that, not really a lot. Oh, you have five theological orations of Saint Gregory the Theologian. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely uh, read that. That's pretty yeah. good. You know what the thing actually is? I do read some uh, abridged versions here and there, but I do want to read like the way they wrote it. Like I do not want to read a review yeah. of a product. I want to use the product. So. Uh, we'll get that one uh, as well. Yeah, it's available. It's you can find it. I mean, it's you can find it on New Advent. The five theological orations is just orations twenty-seven to thirty-one. That's the, yeah. those are the theological oh, orations. Yeah, awesome. So that's pretty much what I would recommend. Yeah, yeah. Well, brother, thank you very much. Now, of course, I will put uh, the links towards uh, your channel as well. Your yeah, you're an absolute beast if it comes to putting out content. Uh, technically, very, very, a lot of, very much up there, but that's the way I personally like it. And I do wish that a lot more people would be uh, that much in depth, not that superficial. So mm -hmm. I wish nothing but the very best for you. Um, uh, God willing, in the, in, the, in the near future, we'll uh, give it a part three. Let's yeah. see what kind, kind of topic we will address then. So. Very enlightening. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff that I've learned again. A lot of stuff that uh, I regurgitated. So that's that we all can benefit from. So, Brother mm -hmm. David, thank you, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Have a great day, everybody.